Chapter One of Away in the Wilderness. Away in the Wilderness by R. M. Ballantyne. The Hunter. On a beautiful summer evening not many years ago, a man was seen to ascend the side of a little mound or hillock on the top of which he lingered to gaze upon the wild scenery that lay stretched out before him. The man wore the leathern coat and leggings of a North American hunter or trapper or backwoodsman, and well did he deserve all these titles, for Jasper Derry was known to his friends as the best hunter, the most successful trapper, and the boldest man in the backwoods. Jasper was big and strong, as well as bold, but he was not a bully. Men of true courage are in general peacefully disposed. Jasper could fight like a lion when there was occasion to do so, but he was gentle and grave and quiet by nature. He was also extremely good-humored, had a low soft voice, and, both in mind and body, seemed to delight in a state of repose. We have said that his coat was made of leather. The moccasins or Indian shoes on his feet were made of the same material. When Jasper first put them on, they were soft like a glove of chamois leather and bright yellow, but hard service had turned them into a dirty brown, which looked more businesslike. The sun had burned his face and hands to as deep a brown as his coat. On his head he wore a little round cap, which he had made with his own hands, after having caught the black fox that supplied the fur in one of his own traps. A colored worsted belt bound his coat round his waist, and beneath the coat he wore a scarlet flannel shirt. A long knife and a small hatchet were stuck in the belt at his back, and in front hung a small cloth bag, which was so thickly ornamented with beads of many colors that little of the cloth could be seen. This last was a fire bag so called because it contained the flint, steel, and tinder required for making a fire. It also contained Jasper's pipe and tobacco, for he smoked as a matter of course. Men smoke everywhere, more's the pity, and Jasper followed the example of those around him. Smoking was almost his only fault. He was a tremendous smoker. Often, when out of tobacco, he had smoked tea. Frequently he had tried bark and dried leaves, and once, when hard-pressed, he had smoked oakum. He would rather have gone without his supper than without his pipe. A powder horn and shot pouch were slung over his shoulders by two cross belts, and he carried a long, single-barreled gun. I have been thus particular in describing Jasper Derry, because he is our hero, and he is worth describing being a fine, hardy, handsome fellow who cared as little for a wild Indian or a grizzly bear as he did for a butterfly, and who was one of the best of companions, as he was one of the best of hunters, in the wilderness. Having gained the top of the hillock, Jasper placed the butt of his long gun on the ground, and, crossing his hands over the muzzle, stood there for some time so motionless that he might have been mistaken for a statue. A magnificent country was spread out before him. Just in front lay a clear lake of about a mile in extent, and the evening was so still that every tree, stone, and bush on its margin was reflected as in a mirror. Here hundreds of wild ducks and wild geese were feeding among the sedges of the bays, or flying to and fro, mingling their cries with those of thousands of plover and other kinds of waterfowl that inhabited the place. At the lower end of this lake a small rivulet was seen to issue forth and wind its way through woods and plains like a silver thread until it was lost to view in the far distance. On the right and left and behind the earth was covered with the dense foliage of the wild woods. The hillock on which the western hunter stood lay in the very heart of that great uncultivated wilderness which forms part of the British possessions in North America. 
this region lies to the north of the canadas is nearly as large as all europe and goes by the name of the hudson's bay territory or rupert's land it had taken jasper many long weeks of hard travel by land and water in canoes and on foot to get there and several weeks of toil still lay before him ere he could attain the object for which his journey had been undertaken wicked people say that woman is at the bottom of all mischief did it ever occur to these same wicked individuals that woman is just as much at the bottom of all good whether for good or for evil woman was at the bottom of jasper derry's heart and affairs the cause of this journey was love the aim and end of it was marriage did true love ever run smooth no never says the proverb we shall see end of chapter one Chapter Two of Away in the Wilderness by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Three Friends. When the hunter had stood for full five minutes gazing at the beautiful scenery by which he was surrounded, it suddenly occurred to him that a pipe would render him much more capable of enjoying it. So he sat down in the trunk of a fallen tree, leaned his gun on it, pulled the fire-bag from his belt and began to fill his pipe, which was one of the kind used by the savages of the country, with a stone head and a wooden stem. It was soon lighted, and Jasper was thinking how much more clear and beautiful a landscape looked through tobacco smoke, when a hand was laid lightly on his shoulder. Looking quickly around, he beheld a tall, dark-faced Indian standing by his side. Jasper betrayed neither alarm nor surprise, for the youth was his own comrade, who had merely come to tell him that the canoe in which they had been traveling together, and which had been slightly damaged, was repaired and ready for service. "'Why, Arrowhead, you steal on me with the soft tread of a fox. My ears are not dull, yet I did not hear your approach, lad.' A smile lightened up the countenance of the young Indian for a moment as he listened to a compliment which gratified him much. But the grave expression which was natural to him instantly returned, as he said, Arrowhead has hunted in the Rocky Mountains where the men are treacherous. He has learned to tread lightly there. No doubt you had need to be always on the lookout where there are such varmints. But here away, Arrowhead, there are no foes to fear and therefore no need to take your friends by surprise. But you're proud of your gifts, lad, and I suppose it's natural to like to show them off. Is the canoe ready? The Indian replied by a nod. That's well, lad. It will be sundown in another hour, and I would like to camp on the Point of Pines tonight. So come along. Hist! exclaimed the Indian pointing to a flock of geese which came into view at that moment. "'Ah, you come of a masterful race,' said Jasper, shaking his head gravely. "'You're never content when you've got enough, but must always be killing God's creatures right and left for pure sport. Haven't we got one gray goose already for supper? And that's enough for two men, surely. Of course, I make no account of the artist, poor creature for he eats next to nothing. However, as your appetite may be sharper set than usual, I've no objection to bring down another for you." So saying, the hunter and the Indian crouched behind a bush, and the former, while he cocked his gun and examined the priming, gave utterance to a series of cries so loud and discordant that anyone who was ignorant of a hunter's ways must have thought he was anxious to drive all the living creatures within six miles of him away in terror. Jasper had no such wish, however. 
He was merely imitating the cry of the wild geese. The birds, which were at first so far off that a rifle ball could not have reached them, no sooner heard the cry of their friends, as they doubtless thought it, than they turned out of their course and came gradually towards the bush where the two men lay hidden. The hunter did not cease to cry until the birds were within gunshot. Then he fixed his eye on one of the flock that seemed plump and fat. The long barrel of the gun was quickly raised, the geese discovered their mistake, and the whole flock were thrown into wild confusion as they attempted to shear off. But it was too late. Smoke and fire burst from the bush, and an enormous gray goose fell with a heavy crash to the ground. "'What have you shot? What have you shot?' cried a shrill and somewhat weak voice in the distance. In another moment the owner of the voice appeared, running eagerly towards the two men. "'Use your eyes, John Haywood, and you won't need to ask,' said Jasper, with a quiet smile as he carefully reloaded his gun. "'Ah, I see, a gray swan. No, surely it cannot be a goose,' said Haywood, turning the bird over and regarding it with astonishment. "'Why, this is the biggest one I ever did see.' "'What's yon in the water?' "'Deer, I do believe,' cried Jasper, quickly drawing the small shot from his gun and putting in a ball instead. "'Come, lads, we shall have venison for supper tonight. That beast can't reach the other side so soon as we can.' Jasper leaped quickly down the hill and dashed through the bushes towards the spot where the canoe lay. He was closely followed by his companions, and in less than two minutes they were darting across the lake in their little Indian canoe, which was made of birch bark, and was so light that one man could carry it easily. While they are thus engaged, I will introduce the reader to John Haywood. This individual was a youth of nineteen or twenty years of age, who was by profession a painter of landscapes and animals. He was tall and slender in person, with straight black hair, a pale, haggard-looking face, an excitable, nervous manner, and an enthusiastic temperament. Being adventurous in his disposition, he had left his father's home in Canada and entreated his friend, Jasper Derry, to take him along with him into the wilderness. At first Jasper was very unwilling to agree to this request, because the young artist was utterly ignorant of everything connected with the life in the woods, and he could neither use a paddle nor a gun. But Haywood's father had done him some service at a time when he was ill and in difficulties, so as the youth was very anxious to go, he resolved to repay this good turn of the father by doing a kindness to the son. Haywood turned out but a poor backwoodsman, but he proved to be a pleasant, amusing companion and as Jasper and the Indian were quite sufficient in the management of the light canoe, and the good gun of the former was more than sufficient to feed the party, it mattered nothing to Jasper that Haywood spent most of his time seated in the middle of the canoe, sketching the scenery as they went along. Still less did it matter that Haywood missed everything he fired at, whether it was close at hand or far away. At first Jasper was disposed to look upon his young companion as a poor useless creature, and the Indian regarded him with undisguised contempt. But after they had been some time in his company, the opinions of those two men of the woods changed, for they found that the artist was wise and well informed on many subjects of which they were extremely ignorant and they beheld with deep admiration the beautiful and lifelike drawings and paintings which he produced in rapid succession. Such was the romantic youth who had, for the sake of seeing and painting the wilderness, joined himself to these rough sons of the forest, and who now sat in the center of the canoe swaying his arms about and shouting with excitement as they quickly drew near to the swimming herd of deer. "'Keep yourself still,' said Jasper, looking over his shoulder. "'You'll upset the canoe if you go on like that.' "'Give me the axe! Give me the axe! I'll kill him!' cried Haywood. "'Take your pencil and draw him,' 
observed the hunter with a quiet laugh. Now, Arrowhead, two good strokes of the paddle will do. There, so. As he spoke, the canoe glanced up alongside of an affrighted deer, and in the twinkling of an eye, Jasper's long knife was in its heart, and the water was dyed with blood. This happened quite near to the opposite shore of the lake, so that in little more than half an hour after it was killed, the animal was cut up and packed, and the canoe was again speeding towards the upper end of the lake, where the party arrived just as night began to fling its dark mantle over the wilderness. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Away in the Wilderness by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Encampment Camping out in the woods at night is truly a delightful thing, and the pleasantest part of it, perhaps, is the lighting of the fire. Light is agreeable to human eyes and cheering to the human heart. Solomon knew and felt that when he penned the words, a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. And the rising of the sun is scarcely more grateful to the feelings than the lighting of a fire on a dark night. So our friends thought and felt when the fire blazed up, but they were too busy and too hungry at the time to think about the state of their feelings. The Indian was hungry. A good fire had to be made before the venison could be roasted, so he gave his whole attention to the felling of dry trees and cutting them up into logs for the fire. Jasper was also hungry, and a slight shower had wetted all the moss and withered grass, so he had enough to do to strike fire with flint and steel, catch a spark on a little piece of tinder, and then blow and coax the spark into a flame. The artist was indeed free to indulge in a little meditation but he had stumbled in the dark on landing and bruised his shins, so he could only sit down on a rock and rub them and feel miserable. But the fire soon caught. Branches were heaped up, great logs were piled on, forked tongues of flame began to leap up and lick the branches of the overhanging trees. The green leaves looked rich and warm. The thick stems looked red and hot. The faces and clothes of the men seemed as if about to catch fire as they moved about the encampment preparing supper. In short, the whole scene was so extremely comfortable, in reality as well as in appearance, that Haywood forgot his bruised shins and began to rub his hands with delight. In a very short time three juicy venison steaks were steaming before the three travelers, and in a much shorter time they had disappeared altogether and were replaced by three new ones. The mode of cooking was very simple. Each steak was fixed on a piece of stick and set up before the fire to roast. When one side was ready, the artist, who seemed to have very little patience, began to cut off pieces and eat them while the other side was cooking. To say truth, Men out in those regions have usually such good appetites that they are not particular as to the cooking of their food. Quantity, not quality, is what they desire. They generally feel very much like the Russian, of whom it is said that he would be content to eat sawdust, if only he got plenty of it. The steaks were washed down with tea. There is no other drink in Rupert's land. The Hudson's Bay Company found that spirits were so hurtful to the Indians that they refused to send them into the country. And at the present day there is no strong drink to be had for love or money over the length and breadth of their territories, except at those places where other fur traders oppose them and oblige them in self-defense to sell fire water, as the Indians call it. Tea is the great, the only drink in Rupert's land. Yes, laugh as you will, ye lovers of gin and beer and whiskey, one who has tried it and has seen it tried by hundreds of stout stalwart men tells you that the teetotaler is the best man for real hard work. 
the three travelers drank their tea and smacked their lips and grinned at each other with great satisfaction. They could not have done more if it had been the best of brandy, and they the jolliest of topers. But the height of their enjoyment was not reached until the pipes were lighted. It was quite a sight to see them smoke. Jasper lay with his huge frame extended in front of the blaze, puffing clouds of smoke thick enough to have shamed a small cannon. Arrowhead rested his back on the stump of a tree, stretched his feet towards the fire, and allowed the smoke to roll slowly through his nostrils as well as out of his mouth, so that it kept curling quietly around his nose, and up to his cheeks, and into his eyes, and through his hair in a most delightful manner, at least so it would seem, for his reddish-brown face beamed with happy contentment. Young Haywood did not smoke, but he drew forth his sketch-book and sketched his two companions, and in the practice of his beloved art, I have no doubt, he was happier than either. "'I wonder how many trading posts the Hudson Bay's company has got,' said Haywood, as he went on with his work. "'Hundreds of them said Jasper, pressing the red-hot tobacco into the bowl of his pipe with the end of his little finger, as slowly and coolly as if his flesh were fireproof. "'I don't know exactly how many they've got. I doubt if anyone does. But they have them all over the country. You've seen a little of the country now, Haywood. Well, what you have seen is very much like what you will see as long as you choose to travel here away. You come to a small clearing in the forest, with five or six log houses in it, a stockade round it, and a flagstaff in the middle of it. Five, ten, or fifteen men, and a gentleman in charge. That's a Hudson's Bay Company trading post. All round it lie the wild woods. Go through the woods for two or three hundred miles, and you'll come to another such post, or fort, as we sometimes call them. That's how it is all the country over. Although there are many of them, the country is so uncommon big that they may be said to be few and far between. Some are bigger and some are less. There's scarcely a settlement in the country worthy of the name of a village except Red River. Ah, Red River, exclaimed Haywood. I've heard much of that settlement. Hold steady. I'm drawing your nose right now. Have you been there, Jasper? That have I, lad, and a fine place it is, extending fifty miles or more along the river, with fine fields and handsome houses and churches and missionaries and schools and what not. But the rest of Rupert's land is just what you have seen. No roads, no houses, no cultivated fields, nothing but lakes and rivers and woods and plains without end and a few Indians here and there, with plenty of wild beasts everywhere. These trading posts are scattered here and there, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and from Canada to the frozen sea, standing solitary-like in the midst of the wilderness, as if they had dropped down from the clouds by mistake and didn't know exactly what to do with themselves. "'How long have the company lived?' inquired Arrowhead, turning suddenly to Jasper. The stout hunter felt a little put out. Um, I don't exactly know, but it must have been a long time, no doubt. Oh, I can tell you that, cried Haywood. You? said Jasper, in surprise. Aye, the company was started nearly two hundred years ago by Prince Rupert, who was the first governor, and that's the reason the country came to be called Rupert's Land. You know its common name is the Hudson's Bay Territory, because it surrounds Hudson's Bay. "'Why, where did you learn that?' said Jasper. "'I thought I knowed a most everything about the company. But I must confess I never knew about Prince Rupert before.' "'I learned it from books,' said the artist. "'Books!' exclaimed Jasper. I never learned nothing from books, more's the pity. I get along well enough in the trappin' and shootin' way without em. But I'm sorry I never learned to read. Ah, 
I've a great opinion of books, so I have. The worthy hunter shook his head solemnly as he said this in a low voice, more to himself than to his companions, and he continued to mutter and shake his head for some minutes while he knocked the ashes out of his pipe. Having refilled and relighted it, he drew his blanket over his shoulder, laid his head upon a tuft of grass, and continued to smoke until he fell asleep and allowed the pipe to fall from his lips. The Indian followed his example with this difference, that he laid aside his pipe and drew the blanket over his head and under his feet, and wrapped it round him in such a way that he resembled a man sewed up in a sack. Haywood was thus compelled to shut his sketch-book, so he also wrapped himself in his blanket and was soon sound asleep. The campfire gradually sank low. Once or twice the end of a log fell, sending up a bright flame and a shower of sparks, which, for a few seconds, lighted up the scene again and revealed the three slumbering figures. But at last the fire died out altogether and left the encampment in such thick darkness that the sharpest eye would have failed to detect the presence of man in that distant part of the lone wilderness. End of chapter 3Chapter Four of Away in the Wilderness by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mosquitoes, Campfire Talk. There is a certain fly in the American forests which is worthy of notice because it exercises a great influence over the happiness of man in those regions. This fly is found in many other parts of the world but it swarms in immense numbers in America, particularly in the swampy districts of that continent, and in the hot months of summer. It is called a mosquito, pronounced mosquito, and it is, perhaps, the most tormenting, the most persevering, savage, vicious little monster on the face of the earth. Other flies go to sleep at night. The mosquito never does. Darkness puts down other flies. It seems to encourage the mosquito. Day and night it persecutes man and beast, and the only time of the twenty-four hours in which it seems to rest is about noon, when the heat puts it down for a little. But this period of rest strengthens it for a renewal of war during the remainder of the day and night. In form the mosquito very much resembles the gnat, but is somewhat larger. This instrument of torture is his nose, which is quite as long as his body and sharper than the finest needle. Being unable to rest because of the mosquitoes, Haywood resolved to have a chat. "'Come, Jasper,' said he, looking up into his companion's grave countenance. "'Although we have been many weeks on this journey now, you have not yet told me what has brought you here, or what the end of your trip is going to be.' "'I've come here a-hunting,' said Jasper, with the look and tone of a man who did not wish to be questioned. "'Nay, now I know that is not the reason,' said Haywood, smiling. "'You could have hunted much nearer home if you had been so minded, and to as good purpose. Come, Jasper, you know I'm your friend, and that I will wish you well. Let me hear what has brought you so far into the wilderness.' Mayhap I can give you some good advice if you do. Well, lad, I don't mind if I do. Though for the matter of good advice, I don't feel much in need of any just at this time. Jasper shook the ashes out of his pipe and refilled it as he spoke. Then he shook his head once or twice and smiled, as if his thoughts amused him. Having lighted the pipe, he stretched himself out in a more comfortable way before the blaze, and said, "'Well, lad, I'll tell you what it is. It's the old story. The love of woman has brought me here.' "'And a very good story it is,' returned Haywood, with a look of interest. "'A poor, miserable set of creatures we should be without that same love of woman. Come, Jasper, I'm glad to hear you're such a sensible fellow.' I know something about that subject myself. 
there's a pretty blue-eyed girl with golden hair down away in Canada that... Haywood stopped short in his speech and sighed. "'Come, it ain't a hopeless case, is it?' said Jasper, with a look of sympathy. "'I rather fear it is, but I hope not. Ah, what should we do without hope in this world?' "'That's true,' observed Jasper, with much gravity. "'We could not get on at all without hope.' "'But come, Jasper,' said the artist. "'Let's hear about your affair, and I'll tell you about mine some other time.' "'Well, there is not much to tell, but I'll give you all that's of it. "'You must know, then, that about two years ago "'I was in the service of the Hudson's Bay Company "'at one of their outposts in the Mackenzie River District. "'We had little to eat there and little to do, "'and I felt so lonesome, "'never seeing a human being except the four or five men at the fort "'and a few Indians, that I made up my mind to quit.' I had no reason to complain of the company, you see. They always treated me handsomely, and it was no fault of theirs that the living in that district was poor and the post lonesome. Well, on my way down to Lake Winnipeg, I fell in with a brigade of boats going to the Saskatchewan district, and we camped together that night. One of the guides of the Saskatchewan brigade had his daughter with him. The guide was a French-Canadian, and his wife had been a Scotch half-caste. So what the daughter was is more than I can tell, but I know what she looked like. She just looked like an angel. It wasn't so much that she was pretty, but she was so sweet and so quiet-looking and so innocent. Well, to cut the matter short, I fell in love at once. Do you know what it is, Haywood, to fall in love at first sight? Oh, don't I, replied the artist with sudden energy. And do you know, continued Jasper, what it is to be fallen in love with at first sight? Well, no, I'm not so sure about that, replied Haywood sadly. I do, then, said Jasper, for that sweet critter fell in love with me right off though what she saw in me to love has puzzled me much. Howsoever, she did, and for that I'm thankful. Her name is Marie Laroche. She and I opened our minds to each other that night, and I took the guide, her father, into the woods, and told him I wanted his daughter. And he was agreeable, but he would not hear of my taking her away then and there. He told me I must go down to Canada and get settled, and when I had a house to put his daughter in, I was to come back into the wilderness here and be married to her, and then take her home. So here I am on my way to claim my bride. But there's one thing that puzzles me sorely. What is that? asked Haywood. I've never heard from Marie from that day to this, said Jasper. That is strange, replied the other. "'But perhaps she cannot write.' "'That's true. Now you speak of it, I do believe she can't write a line. But then she might have got someone to write for her.' "'Did you leave your address with her?' "'How could I, when I had no address to leave?' "'But did you ever send it to her?' "'No, I never thought of that,' said Jasper, opening his eyes very wide. Come, that's a comfort. That's a good reason for never having heard from her. Thank you, lad, for putting me up to it. And now, as we must be up and away in another hour, I'll finish my nap. So saying, Jasper put out his pipe and once more drew his blanket over him. Haywood followed his example, and while he lay there gazing up at the stars through the trees, he heard the worthy hunter muttering to himself, that's it. That accounts for my not hearing from her. A sigh followed the words. Very soon a snore followed the sigh, and ere many minutes had passed away, the encampment was again buried in darkness and repose. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Away in the Wilderness » by R. M. Ballantyne this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
journeying in the wilderness. It seemed to Haywood that he had not been asleep more than five minutes when he was aroused by Jasper laying his heavy hand on his shoulder. On rubbing his eyes and gazing round him, he found that the first streak of dawn was visible in the eastern sky, that the canoe was already in the water, and that his companions were ready to embark. It is usually found that men are not disposed to talk at that early hour. Haywood merely remarked that it was a fine morning, to which Jasper replied by a nod of his head. Nothing more was said. The artist rolled up his blanket in a piece of oiled cloth, collected his drawing materials and put them into their bag, got into his place in the center of the canoe, and immediately went to sleep, while Jasper and the Indian, taking their places in the bow and stern, dipped the paddles into the water and shot away from the shore. They looked mysterious and ghostly in the dim morning light, and the whole scene around them looked mysterious and ghostly too, for the water in the lake seemed black, and the shores and islands looked like dark shadows, and a pale thin mist rolled slowly over the surface of the water and hung overhead. No sound was heard except the light plash of the paddles as the two backwoodsmen urged their little canoe swiftly along. By degrees the light of day increased, and Jasper awakened Haywood in order that he might behold the beautiful scenery through which they passed. They were now approaching the upper end of the lake, in which there were innumerable islands of every shape and size, some of them not more than a few yards in length, while some were two or three hundred yards across, but all were clothed with the most beautiful green foliage and shrubbery. As the pale yellow of the eastern sky began to grow red, ducks and gulls bestirred themselves. Early risers among them first began to chirp and scream and whistle their morning song, for there are lazy ones among the birds, just as there are among men. Sometimes, when the canoe rounded a point of rocks, a flock of geese were found floating peacefully among the sedges, sound asleep, with their heads under their wings. These would leap into the air and fly off in great alarm, with much difficulty and tremendous splutter, reminding one of the proverb, The more haste, the less speed. At other times they would come upon a flock of ducks so suddenly that they had no time to take wing, so they dived instead, and thus got out of the way. Then the yellow hue of sunrise came, a good while before the sun himself rose, the last of the bright stars were put out by the flood of light, and multitudes of little birds on shore began to chirp their morning song. And who can say that this was not a hymn of praise to God, when in the Holy Bible itself, in the 150th Psalm, we find it written, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. At last the sun burst forth in all his golden glory, Water, earth, and sky glowed as if they had been set on fire. What a blessed influence the sun has upon this world! It resembles the countenance of a loving father beaming in upon his family, driving away clouds, and diffusing warmth and joy. The birds were now all astir together, insomuch that the air seemed alive with them. There are small white gulls with red legs and red beaks in those large inland lakes, just as there are in the ocean. These began to utter their sweet wild cries so powerfully that they almost drowned the noise of all the rest. Yet the united chorus of the whole was not harsh. It was softened and mellowed by distance, and fell on the ears of the two hunters as pleasantly as the finest music does in the ears of men trained to sweet sounds from infancy. Not until the sun had ascended a considerable way on its course through the sky did Jasper think it necessary to lay down his paddle. By that time the upper end of the lake had been reached, and the hunter had run the canoe close to a ledge of flat rock and jumped ashore saying that it was time for breakfast. "'I had almost got to believe I was in paradise,' said Haywood, as he stepped ashore. "'I often think there's a good deal of the Garden of Eden still left in this world, 
replied Jasper, as he carried the kettle up to the level part of the rock and began to kindle a fire, while the Indian, as usual, hewed the wood. "'If we could only make use of God's gifts instead of abusing them, I do believe we might be very happy all our days. See there, Jasper, is one of the birds I want so much to get hold of. I want to make a drawing of him. Would you object to spend a shot on such game? Haywood pointed as he spoke to a gray bird, about the size of a blackbird, which sat on a branch close above his head. This creature is called by the fur traders a whiskey john and it is one of the most impudent little birds in the world. Wherever you go throughout the country, there you find whiskey johns ready to receive and welcome you, as if they were the owners of the soil. They are perfectly fearless. They will come and sit on a branch within a yard of your hand when you are eating, and look at you in the most inquisitive manner. If they could speak, they could not say more plainly, what have you got there? Give me some. If you leave the mouth of your provision sack open, they are sure to jump into it. When you are done eating, they will scarcely let you six yards away before they make a dash at the crumbs. And if you throw sticks or stones at them, they will hop out of the way, but they will not make a flight. It would be a pity to waste powder on them critters, said Jasper, but I'll catch one for you. As he said this, he took a few crumbs of broken meat from the bottom of the provision sack and spread them on his right hand. Then he lay down under a bush, covered his face with a few leaves, and thrust out his hand. Haywood and the Indian retired a few paces and stood still to await the result. In a few seconds a whiskey john came flying towards the open hand and alighted on a branch within a yard of it. Here he shook his feathers and looked very bold, but suspicious, for a few minutes, turning first one eye towards the hand and then the other. After a little he hopped on a branch still nearer, and, seeing no motion in the hand, he at last hopped upon the palm and began to peck the crumbs. Instantly the fingers closed, and Jasper caught him by the toes whereupon the whiskey john began to scream furiously with rage and terror. But I am bound to say there was more of rage than of terror in his cry. Jasper handed the passionate bird over to the artist, who tried to make a portrait of him, but he screamed and pecked so fiercely that Haywood was obliged to let him go after making a rough sketch. Breakfast was a repetition of the supper of the night before. It was soon disposed of, and the three travelers again set forth. This time Jasper sang one of the beautiful canoe songs peculiar to that country, and Haywood and Arrowhead, both of whom had good voices, joined in the chorus. They soon passed from the lake into the river by which it was fed. At first the current of this river was sluggish, but as they ascended, it became stronger and was broken here and there by rapids. The severe toil of traveling in the backwoods now began. To paddle on a level lake all day is easy enough, for when you get tired you can lay down the paddle and rest. But in the river this is impossible because of the current. The only way to get a rest is to push the bow of the canoe ashore. It was a fine sight to see the movements of Jasper and the Indian when they came to the first rapid. Haywood knew that he could be of no use, so, like a wise man, he sat still and looked on. The rapid was a very strong one, but there were no falls in it, only a furious gush of water over the broken bed of the river, where many large rocks rose up and caught the current, hurling the water back in white foam. Anyone who knew not what these hunters could do would have laughed if you had told him they were about to ascend that rapid in such an egg-shell of a canoe. They began by creeping up inshore as far as they could. Then they dashed boldly out into the stream, and the current whirled them down with lightning speed, but suddenly the canoe came to a halt in the very middle of the stream. 
Every rock in a rapid has a long tail of still water below it. The canoe had got into one of these tails or eddies, and there it rested securely. A few yards higher up there was another rock, nearer to the opposite bank, and the eddy which tailed off from it came down a little lower than the rock behind which the canoe now lay. There was a furious gush of water between them and this eddy, but the men knew what the canoe could bear, and their nerves were strong and steady. Across they went like a shot. They were swept down to the extreme point of the eddy, but a few powerful strokes of the paddle sent them into it, and next moment they were floating behind the second rock, a few yards higher up the stream. Thus they darted from rock to rock, gaining a few yards at each dart, until at last they swept into the smooth water at the head of the rapid. Many a time this was repeated that day, for rapids were numerous. Their progress was therefore slow. Sometimes they came to parts of the river where the stream was very strong and deep, but not broken by rocks, so that they had no eddies to dart into. In such places Arrowhead and Haywood walked along the bank and hauled the canoe up by means of a line, while Jasper remained in it to steer. This was hard work, for the banks and places were very steep, in some parts composed of soft mud into which the men sank nearly up to their knees, and in other places covered so thickly with bushes that it was almost impossible to force a path through them. Jasper and the Indian took the steering paddle by turns, and when Haywood required a rest he got into his place in the middle of the canoe, but they never halted for more than a few minutes at a time. All day they paddled and dragged the canoe slowly up against the strong current, and when night closed in they found they had advanced only three miles on their journey. The last obstacle they came to that day was a roaring waterfall about thirty feet high. Here, it might have been thought, was an effectual check to them at last. Nothing without wings could have gone up that waterfall, which filled the woods with the thunder of its roar, but the canoe had no wings, so what was to be done? To one ignorant of the customs of that country, going on would have seemed impossible but nothing can stop the advance of a backwoods voyager. If his canoe won't carry him, he carries his canoe. Jasper and his friends did so on the present occasion. They had reached what is called a portage or carrying place, and there are hundreds of such places all over Rupert's land. On arriving at the foot of the fall, Haywood set off at once to a spot from which he could obtain a good view of it and sat down to sketch, while his companions unloaded the canoe and lifted it out of the water. Then Jasper collected together as much of the baggage as he could carry and clambered up the bank with it until he reached the still water at the top of the fall. Here he laid it down and returned for another load. Meanwhile Arrowhead lifted the canoe with great ease placed it on his shoulders, and bore it to the same place. When all had been carried up, the canoe was launched into the quiet water a few hundred yards above the fall, the baggage was replaced in it, and the travelers were ready to continue their voyage. This whole operation is called making a portage. It took about an hour to make this portage. Portages vary in length and in numbers. In some rivers they are few and far between. In others they are so numerous that eight or twelve may have to be made in a day. Many of the portages are not more than an eighth of a mile in length, and are crossed for the purpose of avoiding a waterfall. Some are four or five miles in extent, for many long reaches in the rivers are so broken by falls and rapids that the voyagers find it their best plan to take canoes and baggage on their backs and cut across country for several miles, thus they avoid rough places altogether. Jasper delayed starting for half an hour in order to give Haywood time to finish his sketch of the fall. It began to grow dark when they again embarked, 
So, after paddling upstream until a convenient place was found, they put ashore and encamped within sight of another waterfall, the roar of which, softened by distance, fell upon their ears all that night like the sound of pleasant music. End of chapter 5「Six of Away in the Wilderness by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Outpost On the morning of the second day after the events which I have described in the last chapter, our three travelers arrived at one of the solitary outposts belonging to the fur traders. It stood on the banks of the river and consisted of four small houses made of logs. It covered about an acre of ground, and its only defense was a wall of wooden posts, about two inches apart, which completely surrounded the buildings. "'This fort is a namesake of mine,' said Jasper, when they first sighted it. "'They call it Jasper's house. I spent a day at it when I was here away two years ago.' "'Who is in charge of it?' asked Haywood. A gentleman named Grant, I believe, replied Jasper. That white-painted house in the middle of the square is his. The other house on the right, painted yellow, is where the men live. Mr. Grant has only got six men, poor fellow, to keep him company. He seldom sees a new face here from one end of the year to the other. But he makes a trip once a year to the head post of the district with his furs, and that's a sort of break to him. "'Are there no women at the place?' inquired the artist. "'Only two, replied Jasper. "'At least there were two when I was here last. "'They were the wives of two of the men, Indian women they were, "'with few brains and little or nothing to say. "'But they were useful critters for all that, "'for they could make coats and trousers and moccasins and mittens, and they were first-rate cooks, besides being handy at almost every kind of work. They could even use the gun. I've heard of them bringing down a wild goose on the wing, when none of the men were at hand to let drive at the passing flock. I do believe that's Mr. Grant himself standing at the gate of the fort. Jasper was right. The master of Jasper's house, a big, hearty-looking man of about five and forty, was standing at the gate of his lonely residence, leaning against one of the doorposts, with his hands in his breeches pockets and a short pipe in his mouth. His summer employments had come to an end. No Indians had been near the place for many weeks, and he happened to have nothing at that time to do but eat, smoke, and sleep, which three occupations he usually attended to with much earnestness. Mr. Grant did not observe the canoe approaching from below, for at that time his attention was attracted to something up the river. Suddenly he started, took his pipe from his lips, and, bending forward, listened with deep earnest attention. A faint murmur came floating down on the breeze, sending a thrill of pleasure to the heart of the solitary man, as well it might, for a new face was a rare sight at Jasper's house. At last a loud shout rang through the forest, and five Indian canoes swept round a point of rocks and came suddenly into view, the men tossing their paddles in the air and sending rainbows of spray over their heads as they made for the landing place. These were three or four families of Indians who had come from a long hunting expedition laden with rich furs. Their canoes, though small and light, could hold a wonderful quantity. In the foremost sat a young savage with a brown face, glittering black eyes, and stiff black hair hanging straight down all round his head, except in front, where it was cut short off just above the eyes in order to let his face appear. That fellow's canoe, besides himself, carried his three wives. He was a good hunter and could afford to have three. Had he been a bad hunter, he would have had to content himself, poor fellow, with one. The canoe also contained six or seven heavy packs of furs, a haunch of venison, 
six pairs of rabbits, several ducks and geese, a lump of bear's meat, two little boys and a girl, a large tent made of deer skins, four or five tin kettles, two or three dirty-looking dogs and a gun, several hatchets and a few blankets, two babies and a dead beaver. In short, there was almost no end to what that bark canoe could hold. Yet that Indian, with the stiff black hair, could lift it off the ground when empty, lay it on his shoulders, and carry it for miles through the forest. The other canoes were much the same as this one. In a few minutes they were at the bank, close under the fort, and about the same time Jasper and his friends leaped ashore and were heartily welcomed by Mr. Grant, who was glad enough to see Indians, but was overjoyed to meet with white men. "'Glad to see you, Jasper,' cried Mr. Grant, shaking the hunter by the hand. "'Right glad to see you. It does good to a man to see an old friend like you turn up so unexpectedly. Happy also to meet with you, Mr. Haywood. It's a pleasure I don't often have to meet with a white stranger in this wilderness. Pray, come with me to the house." The fur trader turned to the Indians, and, saying a few words to them in their own language, led the way to his residence. Meanwhile the Indians had tossed everything out of the canoes upon the bank, and the spot which had been so quiet and solitary half an hour before became a scene of the utmost animation and confusion. While the women were employed in erecting the tents, the men strode up to the hall of reception, where Mr. Grant supplied them with tobacco and food to their heart's content. These natives, who, owing to the reddish copper color of their skins, are called red men, were dressed chiefly in clothes made of deer skin, cut much in the same fashion as the garments worn by Jasper Derry. The women wore short gowns, also made of leather, and leggings of the same material. But it was noticeable that the women had leggings more ornamented with gay beads than those of the men, and they wore gaudy kerchiefs around their necks. These women were poor-looking creatures, however. They had a subdued, humble look, like dogs that are used to being kicked. Very different from the bold free-bearing of the men, the reason of this was that they were treated by the men more as beasts of burden than companions. Women among the North American Indians have a hard time of it, poor creatures. While their lords and masters are out at the chase or idly smoking round the fire, the Indian women are employed in cutting firewood and drawing water. Of course they do all the cooking, and as the eating always continues, so the cooking never stops. When these more severe labors are over, they employ their time in making and ornamenting coats, leggings, and moccasins, and very beautiful work they can turn out of their hands. On the voyage the women use the paddles as well as the men, and in journeying through the woods they always carry or drag the heaviest loads. For all this they get few thanks and often when the husbands become jealous they get severely beaten and kicked. It is always thus among savages, and it would seem that just in proportion as men rise from the savage to the civilized state they treat their women better. It is certain that when man embraces the blessed gospel of Christ and learns to follow the law of love, he places woman not only on a level with himself but even above himself and seeks her comfort and happiness before he seeks his own. Few of the red men of North America are yet Christians, therefore they have no gallantry about them, no generous and chivalrous feelings towards the weaker sex. Most of their women are downtrodden and degraded. The first night at Jasper's house was spent in smoking and talking. Here our friend Jasper Derry got news of Marie. To his immense delight he learned that she was well, and living with her father at Fort Erie, near the plains, or prairies as they are called, on the Saskatchewan River. A long journey still lay before our bold hunter, but that was nothing to him. 
he felt quite satisfied to hear that the girl of his heart was well and still unmarried. Next day the serious business of trading commenced at the outpost. "'I should like to get that powder and ball before you begin to trade with the Indians, Mr. Grant,' said Jasper, after breakfast was concluded. "'I'm anxious to be off as soon as possible.' "'No, no, Jasper. I'll not give you a single charge of powder or an ounce of lead this day. You must spend another night with me, my man. I have not had half my talk out with you. You have no need to hurry, for Marie does not know you are coming, so of course she can't be impatient.' Mr. Grant said this with a laugh, for he knew the state of Jasper's heart and understood why he was so anxious to hasten away. "'Besides,' continued the fur trader, "'Mr. Haywood has not half finished the drawing of my fort, which he began yesterday, and I want him to make me a copy of it.' "'I shall be delighted to do so,' said the artist, who was busily engaged in arranging his brushes and colors. "'Well, well,' cried Jasper, "'I suppose I must submit. I fancy you have no objection to stop here another day, Arrowhead?' The Indian nodded gravely as he squatted down on the floor and began to fill his pipe. "'That's settled, then,' said Jasper. "'So I'll go with you to the store, if you'll allow me.' "'With all my heart,' replied the fur trader, who forthwith led the way to the store, followed by the Indians with their packs of furs. Now the store or shop at a Hudson's Bay trading post is a most interesting and curious place. To the Indian especially it is a sort of enchanted chamber, out of which can be obtained everything known under the sun. As there can be only one shop or store at a trading post, it follows that that shop must contain a few articles out of almost every other style of shop in the world. Accordingly, you will find collected within the four walls of that little room knives and guns from Sheffield, cotton webs from Manchester, grindstones from Newcastle, tobacco from Virginia, and every sort of thing from I know not where all. You can buy a blanket or a file, an axe or a pair of trousers, a pound of sugar or a barrel of nails, a roll of tobacco or a tin kettle, everything, in short, that a man can think of or desire. And you can buy it, too, without money. Indeed, you must buy it without money, for there is not such a thing as money in the land. The trade is carried on entirely by barter or exchange. The Indian gives the trader his furs, and the trader gives him his goods. In order to make the exchange fair and equitable, however, everything is rated by a certain standard of value, which is called a maid beaver in one part of the country, a castor in another. The first man that stepped toward the counter was a chief, a big, coarse-looking, disagreeable man, but a first-rate hunter. He had two wives in consequence of his abilities, and the favorite wife now stood at his elbow to prompt, perhaps to caution him. He threw down a huge pack of furs, which the trader opened and examined with care, fixing the price of each skin and marking it down with a piece of chalk on the counter as he went along. There were two splendid black bearskins, two or three dozen martens or sables, five or six black foxes, and a great many silver foxes, besides cross and red ones. In addition to these, he had a number of minks and beaver skins, a few otters, and sundry other furs, besides a new buffalo and deer skins, dressed, and with the hair scraped off. These last skins are used for making winter coats and also moccasins for the feet. After all had been examined and valued, the whole was summed up, and a number of pieces of stick were handed to the chief, each stick representing a castor, so that he knew exactly how much he was worth and proceeded to choose accordingly. First he gazed earnestly at a huge thick blanket, then he counted his sticks and considered. Perhaps the memory of the cold blasts of winter crossed his mind, 
for he quickly asked how many castors it was worth. The trader told him. The proper number of pieces of stick were laid down, and the blanket was handed over. Next, a gun attracted his eye. The gun sent out for the Indian trader very cheap ones, with blue barrels and red stocks. They shoot pretty well, but are rather apt to burst. Indeed, this fate had befallen the chief's last gun, so he resolved to have another, and bought it. Then he looked earnestly for some time at a tin kettle. Boiled meat was evidently in his mind, but at this point his squaw plucked him by the sleeve. She whispered it in his ear. A touch of generosity seemed to come over him, for he pointed to a web of bright scarlet cloth. A yard of this was measured off and handed to his spouse, whose happiness for the moment was complete, for squaws in Rupert's land, like the fair sex in England, are uncommonly fond of finery. As the chief proceeded, he became more cautious and slow in his choice. Finery tempted him on the one hand, necessaries pressed him on the other, and at this point the trader stepped in to help him decide. He recommended, warned, and advised. Twine was to be got for nets and fishing lines, powder and shot, axes for cutting his winter firewood, cloth for his own and his wife's leggings, knives, tobacco, needles, and an endless variety of things, which gradually lessened his little pile of sticks, until at last he reached the sticking point, when all his sticks were gone. "'Now, Dark Eye,' that was the chief's name, "'you've come to the end at last, and a good thing you have made of it this year,' said Mr. Grant, in the Indian language. "'Have you got all you want?' "'Dark Eye wants bullets,' said the chief. "'Ah, to be sure. You shall have a lot of these for nothing, and some tobacco, too,' said the trader, handing the gifts to the Indian. A look of satisfaction lighted up the chief's countenance as he received the gifts, and made way for another Indian to open and display his pack of furs. But Jasper was struck by a peculiar expression in the face of Dark Eye. Observing that he took up one of the bullets and showed it to another savage, our hunter edged near him to overhear the conversation. "'Do you see that ball?' said the chief in a low tone. The Indian to whom he spoke nodded. "'Look here!' Dark Eye put the bullet into his mouth as he spoke, and bit it until his strong sharp teeth sank deep into the lead. Then holding it up, he said, in the same low voice, "'You will know it again?' Once more the savage nodded, and a malicious smile played in his face for a moment. Just then Mr. Grant called out, "'Come here, Jasper. Tell me what you think this otter skin is worth.' Jasper's curiosity had been aroused by the mysterious conduct of Dark Eye, and he would have given a good deal to have heard a little more of his conversation. But being thus called away, he was obliged to leave his place and soon forgot the incident. During the whole of that day the trading of furs was carried on as much as I have now described it. Some of the Indians had large packs and some had small, but all of them had sufficient to purchase such things as were necessary for themselves and their families during the approaching winter, and as each man received from Mr. Grant a present of tobacco, besides a few trinkets of small value, they returned to the hall that night in high good humor. Next day Jasper and his friends bade the hospitable trader farewell, and a few days after that the Indians left him. They smoked a farewell pipe, then struck their tents, and placed them and their packs of goods in the canoes with their wives, children, and dogs. Pushing out into the stream, they commenced the return journey to their distant hunting grounds. Once more their shouts rang through the forest and rolled over the water, and once more the paddle sent the sparkling drops into the air as they dashed ahead, round the point of rocks above the fort, and disappeared, leaving the fur trader, as they found him, smoking his pipe, 
with his hands in his pockets, and leaning against the doorpost of his once again silent and solitary home. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Away in the Wilderness by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Savage Family and a Fight with a Bear. About a week after our travelers left the outpost, Arrowhead had an adventure with a bear, which had well nigh cut short his journey through this world as well as his journey in the wilderness of Rupert's land. It was in the evening of a beautiful day when it happened. The canoe had got among some bad rapids, and as it advanced very slowly, young Haywood asked to be put on shore that he might walk up the banks of the river, which were very beautiful, and sketch. In half an hour he was far ahead of the canoe. Suddenly, on turning round a rocky point, he found himself face to face with a small Indian boy. It is probable that the little fellow had never seen a white man before, and it is certain that Haywood had never seen such a specimen of a brown boy. He was clothed in skin, it is true, but it was the skin in which he had been born, for he had not a stitch of clothing on his fat little body. As the man and the boy stood staring at each other, it would have been difficult to say which opened his eyes widest with amazement. At first Haywood fancied the urchin was a wild beast of some sort on two legs, but a second glance convinced him that he was a real boy. The next thought that occurred to the artist was that he would try to sketch him, so he clapped his hand to his pocket, pulled out his book and pencil, and forthwith began to draw. This terrified the little fellow so much that he turned about and fled howling into the woods. Haywood thought of giving chase, but a noise attracted his attention at that moment, and looking across the river he beheld the boy's father in the same cool dress as his son. The man had been fishing, but when he saw that strangers were passing he threw his blanket round him, jumped into his canoe, and crossed over to meet them. This turned out to be a miserably poor family of Indians, consisting of the father, mother, three girls, and a boy, and a few ill-looking dogs. They all lived together in a little tent or wigwam, made partly of skins and partly of birch bark. This tent was shaped like a cone. The fire was kindled inside, in the middle of the floor. A hole in the side served for a door, and a hole on the top did duty for window and chimney. The family kettle hung above the fire, and the family circle sat around it. A dirtier family and filthier tent one could not wish to see. The father was a poor weakly man and a bad hunter. The squaw was thin, wrinkled, and very dirty, and the children were all sickly looking, except the boy before mentioned who seemed to show more than his fair share of health and rotundity. "'Have you got anything to eat?' inquired Jasper when the canoe reached the place. They had not got much, only a few fish and an owl. "'Poor miserable critters,' said Jasper, throwing them a goose and a lump of venison. "'See there, that'll keep the wolf out of your insides for some time. Have you got anything to smoke?' No, they had nothing to smoke but a few dried leaves. "'Worse and worse!' cried Jasper, pulling a large plug of tobacco from the breast of his coat. "'Here, that'll keep you puffin' for a short bit, anyhow.' Haywood, although no smoker himself, carried a small supply of tobacco just to give away to Indians, so he added two or three plugs to Jasper's gift and Arrowhead gave the father a few charges of powder and shot. They then stepped into their canoe and pushed off with that feeling of light-hearted happiness which always follows the doing of a kind action. "'There's bears up the river,' said the Indian as they were leaving. "'Have you seen them?' inquired Jasper. "'Aye, but could not shoot. No powder, no ball. Look out for them.' "'That will I. 
replied the hunter, and in another moment the canoe was out among the rapids again, advancing slowly up the river. In about an hour afterwards they came to a part of the river where the banks were high and steep. Here Jasper landed to look for the tracks of the bears. He soon found these, and as they appeared to be fresh, he prepared to follow them up. "'We may as well encamp here,' said he to Arrowhead. "'You can go and look for the bears. I will land the baggage and haul up the canoe, and then take my gun and follow you. I see that our friend Haywood is at work with his pencil already.' This was true. The keen artist was so delighted with the scene before him that the moment the canoe touched the land he had jumped out, and, seating himself on the trunk of a fallen tree, with book and pencil, soon forgot everything that was going on around him. Arrowhead shouldered his gun and went away up the river. Jasper soon finished what he had to do and followed him, leaving Haywood seated on the fallen tree. Now the position which Haywood occupied was rather dangerous. The tree lay on the edge of an overhanging bank of clay, about ten feet above the water, which was deep and rapid at that place. At first the young man sat down on the tree trunk near its root, but after a time, finding the position not quite to his mind, he changed it and went close to the edge of the bank. He was so much occupied with his drawing that he did not observe that the ground on which his feet rested actually overhung the stream. As his weight rested on the fallen tree, however, he remained there safe enough and busy for half an hour. At the end of that time he was disturbed by a noise in the bushes. Looking up he beheld a large brown bear coming straight towards him. Evidently the bear did not see him, for it was coming slowly and lazily along, with a quiet meditative expression on its face. The appearance of the animal was so sudden and unexpected that poor Haywood's heart almost leaped into his mouth. His face grew deadly pale, his long hair almost rose on his head with terror, and he was utterly unable to move hand or foot. In another moment the bear was within three yards of him, and being taken by surprise, it immediately rose on its hind legs, which is the custom of bears when about to make or receive an attack. It stared for a moment at the horrified artist. Let not my reader think that Haywood's feelings were due to cowardice. The bravest of men have been panic-stricken when taken by surprise. The young man had never seen a bear before, except in a cage, and the difference between a caged and a free bear is very great. Besides, when a rough-looking monster of this kind comes unexpectedly on a man who is unarmed and has no chance of escape, and rises on its hind legs as if to let him have a full view of its enormous size, its great strength, and its ugly appearance, he may well be excused for feeling a little uncomfortable and looking somewhat uneasy. When the bear rose, as I have said, Haywood's courage returned. His first act was to fling his sketchbook in Bruin's face, and then, uttering a loud yell, he sprang to his feet, intending to run away. But the violence of his action broke off the earth under his feet. He dropped into the river like a lump of lead and was whirled away in a moment. What that bear thought when it saw the man vanish from the spot like a ghost, of course I cannot tell. It certainly looked surprised, and, if it was a bear of ordinary sensibility, it must undoubtedly have felt astonished. At any rate, after standing there, gazing for nearly a minute in mute amazement at the spot where Haywood had disappeared, it let itself down on its forelegs, and, turning round, walked slowly back into the bushes. Poor Haywood could not swim, so the river did what it pleased with him. After sweeping him out into the middle of the stream, and rolling him over five or six times, and whirling him round in an eddy close to the land, and dragging him out again into the main current, and sending him struggling down a rapid, 
it threw him at last like a bundle of old clothes on a shallow where he managed to get on his feet and staggered to the shore in a most melancholy plight thereafter he returned to the encampment like a drowned rat with his long hair plastered to his thin face and his soaked garments clinging tightly to his slender body had he been able to see himself at that moment he would have laughed but not being able to see himself and feeling very miserable he sighed and shuddered with cold and then set to work to kindle a fire and dry himself meanwhile the bear continued its walk up the river arrowhead after a time lost the track of the bear he was in search of and believing that it was too late to follow it up farther that night he turned about and began to retrace his steps not long after that he and the bear met face to face of course the indian's gun was leveled in an instant but the meeting was so sudden that the aim was not so true as usual and although the ball mortally wounded the animal it did not kill him outright there was no time to reload so arrowhead dropped his gun and ran he doubled as he ran and made for the encampment but the bear ran faster it was soon at the indian's heels knowing that farther flight was useless arrowhead drew the hatchet that hung at his belt and turning around faced the infuriated animal which instantly rose on its hind legs and closed with him the indian met it with a tremendous blow of his axe seized it by the throat with his left hand and endeavored to repeat the blow but brave and powerful though he was the indian was like a mere child in the paw of the bear the axe descended with a crash on the monster's head and sank into its skull but bears are notoriously hard to kill this one scarcely seemed to feel the blow next instant arrowhead was down and with its claws fixed in the man's back the bear held him down while it began to gnaw the fleshy part of his left shoulder no cry escaped from the prostrate hunter he determined to lie perfectly still as if he were dead that being his only chance of escape but the animal was furious and there is little doubt that the indian's brave spirit would soon have fled had not god mercifully sent jasper derry to his relief that stout hunter had been near at hand when the shot was fired he at once ran in the direction whence the sound came and arrived on the scene of the struggle just as arrowhead fell without a moment's hesitation he dropped on one knee took a quick but careful aim and fired the ball entered the bear's head just behind the ear and rolled it over dead arrowhead's first act on rising was to seize the hand of his deliverer and in a tone of deep feeling exclaimed my brother i said jasper with a quiet smile as he reloaded his gun this is not the first time that you and i have helped one another in the nick of time arrowhead we shall be brothers and good friends to boot i hope as long as we live good said the indian a smile lighting up for one moment his usually grave features but my brother is wounded let me see said jasper it will soon be well said the indian carelessly as he took off his coat and sat down on the bank while the white hunter examined his wounds this was all that was said on the subject by these two men they were used to danger in every form and had often saved each other from sudden death the indian's wounds though painful were trifling jasper dressed them in silence and then drawing his long hunting knife he skinned and cut up the bear while his companion lay down on the bank smoked his pipe and looked on having cut off the best parts of the carcass for supper the hunters returned to the canoe carrying the skin along with them end of chapter seven chapter eight of away in the wilderness by r m ballantyne 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Running the Falls Wild Scenes and Men Next day the travelers reached one of those magnificent lakes of which there are so many in the wild woods of North America, and which are so like to the great ocean itself that it is scarcely possible to believe them to be bodies of fresh water until they are tasted. The largest of these inland seas is the famous Lake Superior, which is so enormous in size that ships can sail on its broad bosom for several days out of sight of land. It is upwards of three hundred miles long and about one hundred and fifty miles broad. A good idea of its size may be formed from the fact that it is large enough to contain the whole of Scotland and deep enough to cover her highest hills. The lake on which the canoe was now launched, although not so large as Superior, was, nevertheless, a respectable body of water on which the sun was shining as if on a shield of bright silver. There were numbers of small islets scattered over its surface, some thickly wooded on the water's edge, others little better than bare rocks. Crossing this lake they came to the mouth of a pretty large stream and began to ascend it. The first thing they saw on rounding a bend in the stream was an Indian tent, and in front of this tent was an Indian baby hanging from the branch of a tree. Let not the reader be horrified. The child was not hanging by the neck, but by the handle of its cradle, which its mother had placed there to keep her little one out of the way of the dogs. The Indian cradle is a very simple contrivance. A young mother came out of the tent with her child just as the canoe arrived, and began to pack it in its cradle. Jasper stopped for a few minutes to converse with one of the Indians, so that the artist had a good opportunity of witnessing the whole operation. The cradle was simply a piece of flat board, with a bit of scarlet cloth fastened down each side of it. First of all, the mother laid the poor infant, which was quite naked, sprawling on the ground. A dirty-looking dog took advantage of this to sneak forward and smell at it, whereupon the mother seized a heavy piece of wood and hit the dog with such a rap over the nose as sent it away howling. Then she spread a thick layer of soft moss on the wooden board. Above this she laid a very neat small blanket about two feet in length. Upon this she placed the baby which objected at first to go to bed, squalled a good deal, and kicked a little. The mother therefore took it up, turned it over, gave it one or two hearty slaps, and laid it down again. This seemed to quiet it, for it afterwards lay straight out and perfectly still, with its coal-black eyes staring out of its fat brown face, as if it were astonished at receiving such rough treatment. The mother next spread a little moss over the child, and above that she placed another small blanket, which she folded and tucked in very comfortably, keeping the little one's arms close to its sides, and packing it all up, from neck to heels, so tightly that it looked more like the making of a parcel than the wrapping up of a child. This done, she drew the scarlet cloth over it from each side of the cradle, and laced it down the front. When all was done, the infant looked like an Egyptian mummy, nothing but the head being visible. The mother then leaned the cradle against the stern of a tree, and immediately one of the dogs ran against it and knocked it over. Luckily there was a wooden bar attached to the cradle, in front of the child's face, which bar is placed there on purpose to guard against injury from such accidents, so that the bar came first to the ground and thus prevented the flattening of the child's nose, which, to say truth, was flat enough already. Instead of scolding herself for her own carelessness, the Indian mother scolded the dog, and then hung the child on the branch of a tree to keep it from further mischief. The next turn in the river revealed a large waterfall, up which it was impossible to paddle, so they prepared to make a portage. Before arriving at the foot of it, however, 
Jasper landed Haywood to enable him to make a sketch, and then the two men shoved off and proceeded to the foot of the fall. They were lying there in an eddy, considering where was the best spot to land, when a loud shout drew their attention towards the rushing water. Immediately after, a boat was seen to hover for a moment on the brink of the waterfall. This fall, although about ten or fifteen feet high, had such a large body of water rushing over it that the river, instead of falling straight down, gushed over in a steep incline. Down this incline the boat now darted with the speed of lightning. It was full of men, two of whom stood erect, the one in the bow, the other in the stern, to control the movements of the boat. For a few seconds there was deep silence. The men held their breath as the boat leaped along with the boiling flood. There was a curling white wave at the foot of the fall. The boat cut through this like a knife, drenching her crew with spray. Next moment she swept round into the eddy where the canoe was floating, and the men gave vent to a loud cheer of satisfaction as having run the fall in safety. But this was not the end of that exciting scene. Scarcely had they gained the land when another boat appeared on the crest of the fall. Again a shout was given and a dash made. For one moment there was a struggle with the raging flood, and then a loud cheer as the second boat swept into the eddy in safety. Then a third and a fourth boat went through the same operation, and before the end of a quarter of an hour six boats ran the fall. The bay at the foot of it, which had been so quiet and solitary when Jasper and his friends arrived, became the scene of the wildest confusion and noise as the men ran about with tremendous activity, making preparations to spend the night there. Some hauled might and main at the boats, some carried up the provisions, frying pans and kettles, others cut down dry trees with their axes and cut them up into logs from five to six feet long and as thick as a man's thigh. These were intended for six great fires, each boat's crew requiring a fire to themselves. While this was going on, the principal guides and steersmen crowded round our three travelers and plied them with questions for it was so unusual to meet with strangers in that far-off wilderness that a chance meeting of this kind was regarded as quite an important event. "'You're bound for York Fort, no doubt,' said Jasper, addressing a tall, handsome man of between forty and fifty, who was the principal guide. "'Aye, that's the end of our journey. You see, we're taking our furs down to the coast. Have you come from York Fort, friend?' "'No, I've come all the way from Canada,' said Jasper, who thereupon gave them a short account of his voyage. "'Well, Jasper, you'll spend the night with us, won't you?' said the guide. "'That will I, right gladly. "'Come, then. I see the fires are beginning to burn. We may as well have a pipe and a chat while supper is getting ready.' The night was now closing in, and the scene in the forest— when the campfires began to blaze, was one of the most stirring and romantic sights that could be witnessed in that land. The men of the brigade were some of them French Canadians, some natives of the Orkney Islands, who had been hired and sent out there by the Hudson's Bay Company, others were half-breeds, and a few were pure Indians. They were all dressed in what is called voyageur costume coats or capotes of blue or gray cloth, with hoods to come over their heads at night, and fastened round their waist with scarlet worsted belts, corduroy or gray trousers, gartered outside at the knees, moccasins and caps. But most of them threw off their coats and appeared in blue and red striped cotton shirts, which were open at the throat exposing their broad, sunburned, hairy chests. There was variety, too, in the caps. Some had scotch bonnets, others red nightcaps, a few had tall hats, ornamented with gold and silver cords and tassels, and a good many wore no covering at all except their own thickly matted hair. 
Their faces were burned to every shade of red, brown, and black from constant exposure, and they were strong as lions, wild as zebras, and frolicsome as kittens. It was no wonder, then, that Haywood got into an extraordinary state of excitement and delight as he beheld these wild, fine-looking men smoking their pipes and cooking their suppers, sitting, lying, and standing, talking and singing and laughing, with teeth glistening and eyes glittering in the red blaze of the fires, each of which fires was big enough to have roasted a whole ox. The young artist certainly made good use of his opportunity. He went about from fire to fire, sketchbook in hand, sketching all the best-looking men in every possible attitude, sometimes singly and sometimes in groups of five or six. He then went to the farthest end of the encampment, and in the light of the last fire made a picture of all the rest. The kettles were soon steaming. These hung from tripods erected over the fires. Their contents were flour and pemmican, made into a thick soup called rubaboo. As pemmican is a kind of food but little known in this country, I may as well describe how it is made. In the first place, it consists of buffalo meat. The great plains or prairies of America, which are like huge downs or commons hundreds of miles in extent, afford grass sufficient to support countless herds of deer, wild horses, and bisons. The bisons are called by the people there buffaloes. The buffalo is somewhat like an enormous ox, but its hindquarters are smaller and its forequarters much larger than those of the ox. Its hair is long and shaggy, particularly about the neck and shoulders, where it becomes almost a mane. Its horns are thick and short, and its look is very ferocious. But it is in reality a timid creature, and will only turn to attack a man when it is hard-pressed and cannot escape. Its flesh is first-rate for food, even better than beef, and there is a large hump on its shoulder, which is considered the best part of the animal. Such is the bison or buffalo from which pemmican is made. When a man wishes to make a bag of pemmican, he first of all kills the buffalo, not an easy thing to do by any means, for the buffalo runs well. Having killed him, he skins him and cuts up the meat also a difficult thing to do, especially if one is not used to that sort of work. Then he cuts the meat into thin layers and hangs it up to dry. Dried meat will keep for a long time. It is packed up in bales and sent about that country to be used as food. The next thing to be done is to make a bag of the raw hide of the buffalo. This is done with a glover's needle the raw sinews of the animal being used instead of thread. The bag is usually about three feet long and eighteen inches broad, and the hair is left on the outside of it. A huge pot is now put on the fire, and the fat of the buffalo is melted down. Then the dried meat is pounded between two stones until it is torn and broken up into shreds, after which it is put into the bag the melted fat is poured over it, and the whole is well mixed. The last operation is to sew up the mouth of the bag and leave it to cool, after which the pemmican is ready for use. In this state a bag of pemmican will keep fresh and good for years. When the search was going on in the polar regions for the lost ships of Sir John Franklin, one of the parties hid some pemmican in the ground, intending to return and take it up. They returned home, however, another way. Five years later, some travelers discovered this pemmican, and it was found at that time to be fit for food. Pemmican is extensively used throughout Rupert's Land, especially during summer, for at that season the brigades of boats start from hundreds of inland trading posts to take the furs to the coast for shipment to England, and pemmican is found to be not only the best of food for these hard-working men, but exceedingly convenient to carry. Supper finished, 
the wild-looking fellows of this brigade took to their pipes and threw fresh logs on the fires, which roared and crackled and shot up their forked tongues of flame, as if they wished to devour the forest. Then the song and the story went around, and men told of terrible fights with the red men of the prairies, and desperate encounters with grizzly bears in the Rocky Mountains, and narrow escapes among the rapids and falls, until the night was half spent. Then, one by one, each man wrapped himself in his blanket, stretched himself on the ground with his feet towards the fire, and his head pillowed on a coat or a heap of brushwood, and went to sleep. Ere long they were all down, except one or two long-winded storytellers, who went on muttering to their pipes after their comrades were asleep. Even these became tired at last of the sound of their own voices, and gradually every noise in the camp was hushed, except the crackling of the fires as they sank by degrees and went out, leaving the place in dead silence and total darkness. With the first peep of dawn the guide arose. In ten minutes after his first shout the whole camp was astir. The men yawned a good deal at first, and grumbled a little, and stretched themselves violently, and yawned again but soon they shook off laziness and sprang to their work. Pots, pans, kettles, and pemmican bags were tossed into the boats, and in the course of half an hour they were ready to continue the voyage. Jasper stood beside the guide looking on at the busy scene. "'Heard you any news from the Saskatchewan of late?' said he. "'Not much,' replied the guide. There's little stirring there just now, except among the Indians, who have been killing and scalping each other as usual. But, by the way, that reminds me. There has been a sort of row between the Indians and the company's people at Fort Erie. Fort Erie, said Jasper with a start. Aye, that's the name of the fort, if I remember right, returned the guide. It seems that one of the men there... I think they call him La Roche. But what makes you start, friend Jasper? Do you know anything of this man? Yes, he's a friend of mine. Go on, let me hear about it. Well, there's not much to tell, resumed the guide. This La Roche, it would appear, has got into hot water. He has a daughter, a good-looking wench, I'm told, and, better than that, a well-behaved one. One of the Indians has been impertinent to the girl, so old La Roche, who seems to be a fiery fellow, up fist, hit him on the nose, and knocked the savage flat on his back. A tremendous howl was set up, and knives and hatchets were flourished. But Mr. Pemberton, who is in charge of Fort Erie, ran in and pacified them. The Indian that was floored vows he'll have the hair of old La Roche's head. This taking the hair off people's heads, or scalping, as it is called, is a common practice among the North American Indians. When a savage kills his enemy, he runs his scalping knife round the dead man's head, seizes the hair with his left hand, and tears the scalp off. Indeed, this dreadful cruelty is sometimes practiced before death has occurred. The scalp, with its lock of hair, is taken home by the victor and hung up in his tent as a trophy of war. The man who can show the greatest number of scalps is considered the greatest warrior. The dresses of Indian warriors are usually fringed with human scalp locks. "'That's a bad business,' said Jasper, who was concerned to hear such news of his intended father-in-law. "'Do you know the name of this red-skinned rascal?' "'I heard it mentioned,' said the guide, "'but I can't remember it at this moment.' "'The boats are ready to start,' said one of the steersmen, coming up just then. "'Very good. Let the men embark. "'Now, Jasper, we must part. "'Give us a shake of your hand. "'A pleasant trip to you.' "'The same to you, friend,' said Jasper, returning the guide's squeeze. In another minute the boats were away. 
"'Now, friends, we shall start,' said Jasper, breaking the deep silence which followed the departure of the brigade. "'Good,' said Arrowhead. "'I'm ready,' said Haywood. The canoe was soon in the water, and the men in their places. But they started that morning without a song. Arrowhead was never inclined to be noisy, Haywood was sleepy, and Jasper was rendered anxious by what he had heard of his friends at Fort Erie, so they paddled away in silence. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Away in the Wilderness by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fort and an Unexpected Meeting. We turn now to a very different scene. It is a small fort or trading post on the banks of a stream which flows through the prairie. The fort is very much like the one which has already been described, but somewhat stronger and there are four blockhouses, or bastions, one at each corner, from which the muzzles of a few heavy guns may be seen protruding. The trees and bushes have been cleared away from around this fort, and the strips of forest land which run along both sides of the river are not so thickly wooded as the country through which the reader has hitherto been traveling. In front of the fort rolls the river. Immediately behind it lies the boundless prairie, which extends like a sea of grass, with scarcely a tree or bush upon it as far as the eye can reach. This is Fort Erie. You might ride for many days over that prairie without seeing anything of the forest, except a clump of trees and bushes here and there, and now and then a little pond. The whole region is extremely beautiful one that ought to fill the hearts of men with admiration and love of the bountiful God who formed it. But men in those regions, at the time I write of, thought of little beauties of nature, and cared nothing for the goodness of God. At least this may be truly said of the red-skinned owners of the soil. It was otherwise with some of the white people who dwelt there. Three weeks had passed away since the night spent by our friends with the brigade. It was now a beautiful evening, a little after sunset. The day's work at the fort had been finished, and the men were amusing themselves by racing their horses, of which fine animals there were great numbers at Fort Erie. Just a little after the sun had gone down, three horsemen appeared on the distant prairie and came bounding at full gallop towards the fort. They were our friends Jasper, Haywood, and Arrowhead. These adventurous travelers had reached a fort farther down the river two days before, and, having been supplied with horses, had pushed forward by way of the plains. On entering the belt of woods close to the fort, the horsemen reined in and rode among the trees more cautiously. "'Here's the end of our journey at last,' cried Jasper on whose bronzed countenance there was a deep flush of excitement and a look of anxiety. Just as he said this, Jasper's heart appeared to leap into his throat and almost choked him. Pulling up suddenly, he swallowed his heart with some difficulty and said, "'Hold on, lads. I'll ride round to the fort by way of the river, for reasons of my own. Push on, Haywood, with the Indian.' and let Mr. Pemberton know I'm coming. See, I will give you the packet of letters we were asked to carry from the fort below. Now make haste." Haywood, though a little surprised at this speech, and at the manner of his friend, took the packet in silence and rode swiftly away, followed by the Indian. When they were gone, Jasper dismounted, tied his horse to a tree, and walked quickly into the woods in another direction. Now, this mysterious proceeding is not difficult to explain. Jasper had caught sight of a female figure walking under the trees at a considerable distance from the spot where he had pulled up. He knew that there were none but Indian women at Fort Erie at that time, and that, therefore, the only respectably dressed female at the place must needs be his own Marie Laroche. 
Overjoyed at the opportunity thus unexpectedly afforded him of meeting her alone, he hastened forward with a beating heart. Marie was seated on the stump of a fallen tree when the hunter came up. She was a fair, beautiful woman of about five-and-twenty, with an air of modesty about her which attracted love, yet repelled familiarity. Many a good-looking and well-doing young fellow had attempted to gain the heart of Marie during the last two years, but without success, for this good reason, that her heart had been gained already. She was somewhat startled when a man appeared thus suddenly before her. Jasper stood in silence for a few moments, with his arms crossed upon his breast, and gazed earnestly into her face. As he did not speak, she said, "'You appear to be a stranger here. Have you arrived lately?' Jasper was for a moment astonished that she did not at once recognize him, and yet he had no reason to be surprised. Besides the alteration that two years sometimes makes in a man, Jasper had made a considerable alteration on himself. When Marie last saw him, he had been in the habit of practicing the foolish and unnatural custom of shaving, and he had carried it to such an extreme that he shaved off everything, whiskers, beard, and mustache. But within a year he had been induced by a wise friend to change his opinion on this subject. That friend had suggested that as Providence had caused hair to grow on his cheeks, lips, and chin, it was intended to be worn, and that he had no more right to shave his face than a Chinaman had to shave his head. Jasper had been so far convinced that he had suffered his whiskers to grow. These were now large and bushy, and had encroached so much on his chin as to have become almost a beard. Besides this, not having shaved any part of his face during the last three weeks, there was little of it visible except his eyes, forehead, and cheekbones. All the rest was more or less covered with black hair. No wonder, then, that Marie, who believed him to be two thousand miles away at that moment, did not recognize him in the increasing darkness of evening. The lover at once understood this, and he resolved to play the part of a stranger. He happened to have the power of changing his voice, a power possessed by many people, and, trusting to the increasing gloom to conceal him, and to the fact that he was the last person in the world whom Marie might expect to see there, he addressed her as follows. I am indeed a stranger here. At least I have not been at the post for a very long time. I have just reached the end of a long voyage. Indeed, said the girl, interested by the stranger's grave manner. May I ask where you have come from? I have come all the way from Canada, young woman, and I count myself lucky in meeting with such a pleasant face at the end of my journey. From Canada? exclaimed Marie, becoming still more interested in the stranger, and blushing deeply as she asked, "'You have friends there, no doubt?' "'Aye, a few,' said Jasper. "'And what has brought you such a long way into this wild wilderness?' asked Marie, sighing as she thought of the hundreds of miles that lay between Fort Erie and Canada. "'I have come here to get me a wife,' replied Jasper. "'That is strange,' said the girl, smiling, "'for there are few but Indian women here. "'A stout hunter like you might find one nearer home, I should think.' Here Marie paused, for she felt that on such a subject she ought not to converse with the stranger. Yet she could not help adding, "'But perhaps, as you say, you have been in this part of the world before. "'You may have someone in your mind?' I am engaged, said Jasper abruptly. On hearing this, Marie felt more at her ease, and being of a very sympathetic nature, she at once courted the confidence of the stranger. May I venture to ask her name? said Marie with an arch smile. I may not tell, replied Jasper. I have a comrade who is entitled to know this secret before anyone else. 
"'Perhaps you may have heard of him, for he was up in these parts two years agone. His name is Jasper Derry.' The blood rushed to Marie's temples on hearing the name, and she turned her face away to conceal her agitation, while in a low voice she said, "'Is Jasper Derry, then, your intimate friend?' "'That is he, a very intimate friend indeed. But you appear to know him.' "'Yes, I, I know him. I have seen him. I hope he is well,' said Marie." and she listened with a beating heart for the answer, though she still turned her face away. "'Oh, he's well enough,' said Jasper. "'Sickness don't often trouble him. He's going to be married.' Had a bullet struck the girl's heart, she could not have turned more deadly pale than she did on hearing this. She half rose from the tree stump, and would have fallen to the ground, insensible, had not Jasper caught her in his arms. "'My own Marie,' said he fervently, "'forgive me, dearest, forgive my folly, my wickedness, in deceiving you in this fashion. Oh, what a fool I am!' he added, as the poor girl still hung heavily in his grasp. "'Speak to me, Marie, my own darling.' Whether it was the earnestness of his voice, or the kiss which he printed on her forehead, or the coolness of the evening air, I know not but certain it is that Marie recovered in the course of a few minutes, and, on being convinced that Jasper really was her old lover, she resigned herself wisely to her fate, and held such an uncommonly long conversation with the bold hunter that the moon was up and the stars were out before they turned their steps towards the fort. "'Why, Jasper Derry!' cried Mr. Pemberton, as the hunter entered the hall of Fort Erie. "'Where have you been? I've been expecting you every moment for the last two hours.' "'Well, you see, Mr. Pemberton, I just went down the river a short bit to see an old friend, and I was kept longer than I expected,' said Jasper, with a cool, grave face, as he grasped and shook the hand which was held out to him. "'Ah, I see. You hunters are more like brothers than friends.' No doubt you went to smoke a pipe with Hawkeye, or to have a chat with the muskrat, about old times," said the fur trader, mentioning the names of two Indians who were celebrated as being the best hunters in the neighborhood, and who had been bosom friends of Jasper when he resided there two years before. No, I've not yet smoked a pipe with Hawkeye, neither have I seen muskrat, but I certainly have had a pretty long chat with one of my old friends answered Jasper, while a quiet smile played in his face. "'Well, come along and have a pipe and a chat with me. I hope you count me one of your friends, too,' said Mr. Pemberton, conducting Jasper into an inner room, where he found Haywood and Arrowhead seated at a table, doing justice to a splendid supper of buffalo tongues, venison steaks, and marrow bones. "'Here are your comrades, you see, hard at work.' It's lucky you came tonight, Jasper, for I intend to be off tomorrow morning, by break of day, on a buffalo hunt. If you had been a few hours later of arriving, I should have missed you. Come, will you eat or smoke? I'll eat first, if you have no objection, said Jasper, and smoke afterwards. Very good. Sit down, then, and get to work. Meanwhile, I'll go and look after the horses that we intend to take with us tomorrow. Of course, you'll accompany us, Jasper? I'll be very glad, and so will Arrowhead there. There's nothing he likes so much as a chase after a buffalo, unless, it may be, the eating of him. But as for my friend and comrade, Mr. Haywood, he must speak for himself. I will be delighted to go, answered the artist. Nothing will give me more pleasure, but I fear my steed is too much exhausted to— Oh, make your mind easy on that score, said the fur trader, interrupting him. I have plenty of capital horses and can mount the whole of you, so that's settled. And now, friends, do justice to your supper. I shall be back before you have done. So saying, Mr. Pemberton left the room, and our three friends— being unusually hungry, 
fell vigorously to work on the good cheer of Fort Erie. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Away in the Wilderness by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Buffalo Hunting on the Prairies. Next day, most of the men of Fort Erie, headed by Mr. Pemberton, rode away into the prairies on a buffalo hunt. Jasper would willingly have remained with Marie at the fort, but having promised to go, he would not now draw back. The band of horsemen rode for three hours at a quick pace over the grassy plains without seeing anything. Jasper kept close behind his friend, old Laroche, while Haywood rode and conversed chiefly with Mr. Pemberton. There were about twenty men altogether, armed with guns, and mounted on their best buffalo runners, as they styled the horses which were trained to hunt the buffalo. Many of these steeds had been wild horses, caught by the Indians, broken in, and sold by them to the fur traders. "'I have seldom ridden so long without meeting buffaloes,' observed Mr. Pemberton, as the party galloped to the top of a ridge of land from which they could see the plains far and wide around them. "'There they are at last,' said Haywood eagerly, pointing to a certain spot on the far-off horizon where living creatures of some sort were seen moving." "'That must be a band of redskins,' said Jasper, who trotted up at this moment with the rest of the party. "'They are Sotos,' observed Arrowhead quietly. "'You must have good eyes, friend,' said Pemberton, applying a small pocket telescope to his eye. "'They are indeed Sotos. I see by their dress. And they have observed us, for they are coming straight this way like the wind.' "'Will they come as enemies or friends?' inquired Haywood. "'As friends, I have no doubt,' replied the fur trader. "'Come, lads, we will ride forward to meet them.' In a short time the two parties of horsemen met. They approached almost at full speed, as if each meant to ride the other down, and did not rein up until they were so close that it seemed impossible to avoid a shock. "'Have you seen the buffaloes lately?' inquired Pemberton, after the first salutation had passed. "'Yes, there are large bands not an hour's ride from this. Some of our young warriors have remained to hunt. We are going to the fort to trade.' "'Good. You will find tobacco enough there to keep you smoking till I return with fresh meat,' said Pemberton, in the native tongue, which he could speak like an Indian." I'll not be long away. Farewell." No more words were wasted. The traders galloped away over the prairie, and the Indians, of whom there were about fifteen, dashed off in the direction of the fort. These Indians were a very different set of men from those whom I have already introduced to the reader in a former chapter. There are many tribes of Indians in the wilderness of Rupert's land and some of the tribes are at constant war with each other. But in order to avoid confusing the reader, it may be as well to divide the Indian race into two great classes, namely, those who inhabit the woods and those who roam over the plains or prairies. As a general rule, the thick wood Indians are a more peaceful set of men than the prairie Indians. They are few in number and live in a land full of game, where there is far more than enough of room for all of them. Their mode of traveling in canoes and on foot is slow, so that the different tribes do not often meet, and they have no occasion to quarrel. They are, for the most part, a quiet and harmless race of savages, and being very dependent on the fur traders for the necessaries of life, they are on their good behavior and seldom do much mischief. It is very different with the Plain Indians. These savages have numbers of fine horses and live in a splendid open country, which is well stocked with deer and buffaloes, besides other game. They are bold riders and scour over the country in all directions, consequently the different tribes often come across each other when out hunting. 
quarrels and fights are the results, so that these savages are naturally a fierce and warlike race. They are independent, too, for although they get their guns and ammunition and other necessaries from the traders, they can manage to live without these things if need be. They can clothe themselves in the skins of wild animals, and when they lose their guns or wet their powder, they can kill game easily with their own bows and arrows. It was a band of these fellows that now went galloping towards Fort Erie with the long manes and tails of the half-wild horses and the scalp-locks on their dresses and their own long black hair streaming in the wind. Pemberton and his party soon came up with the young Indians who had remained to chase the buffaloes. He found them sheltered behind a little mound, making preparations for an immediate attack on the animals, which, however, were not yet visible to the men from the fort. "'I do believe they've seen buffaloes on the other side of that mound,' said Pemberton, as he rode forward. He was right. The Indians, of whom there were six, well mounted and armed with strong short bows, pointed to the mound and said that on the other side of it there were hundreds of buffaloes. As the animals were so numerous, no objection was made to the fur traders joining in the hunt. So in another moment the united party leaped from their horses and prepared for action. Some wiped out and carefully loaded their guns, others examined the priming of their pieces, and chipped the edges off the flints to make sure of their not missing fire. All looked to the girths of their saddles, and a few threw off their coats and rolled their shirt-sleeves up to their shoulders, as if they were going to undertake hard and bloody work. Mr. Pemberton took in hand to look after our friend Haywood. The rest were well qualified to look after themselves. In five minutes they were all remounted and rode quietly to the brow of the mound. Here an interesting sight presented itself. The whole plain was covered with huge, unwieldy forms of the buffaloes. They were scattered about, singly and in groups, grazing or playing or lying down, and in one or two places some of the bulls were engaged in single combat, pawing the earth, goring each other, and bellowing furiously. After one look, the hunters dashed down the hill and were in the midst of the astonished animals almost before they could raise their heads to look at them. Now commenced a scene which it is not easy to describe correctly. Each man had selected his own group of animals so that the whole party was scattered in a moment. "'Follow me!' cried Pemberton to Haywood. Observe what I do, and then go try it yourself." The fur trader galloped at full speed towards a group of buffaloes which stood right before him, about two hundred yards off. He carried a single-barreled gun with a flintlock in his right hand and a bullet in his mouth, ready to reload. The buffaloes gazed at him for one moment in stupid surprise, and then, with a toss of their heads and a whisk of their tails, they turned and fled. At first they ran with a slow, awkward gait like pigs, and to one who did not know their powers it would seem that the fast-running horses of the two men would quickly overtake them. But as they warmed to the work their speed increased, and it required the horses to get up their best paces to overtake them. After a furious gallop, Pemberton's horse ran close up alongside of a fine-looking buffalo cow, so close that he could almost touch the side of the animal with the point of his gun. Dropping the rein, he pointed the gun without putting it to his shoulder and fired. The ball passed through the animal's heart, and it dropped like a stone. At the same moment, Pemberton flung his cap on the ground beside it, so that he might afterwards claim it as his own. The well-trained horse did not shy at the shot, neither did it check its pace for a moment, but ran straight on and soon placed its master alongside of another buffalo cow. In the meantime Pemberton loaded like lightning. He let the reins hang loose, knowing that the horse understood his work, 
and seizing the powder horn at his side with his right hand, drew the wooden stopper with his teeth and poured a charge of powder into his left, guessing the quantity, of course. Pouring this into the gun, he put the muzzle to his mouth and spat the ball into it, struck the butt on the pommel of the saddle and set it down, as well as to drive the powder into the pan, and taking his chance of the gun priming itself, he aimed as before and pulled the trigger. The explosion followed, and a second buffalo lay dead upon the plain, with a glove beside it to show to whom it belonged. Scenes similar to this were being enacted all over the plain, with this difference, that the bad or impatient men sometimes fired too soon and missed their mark, or by only wounding the animals, infuriated them and caused them to run faster. One or two ill-trained horses shied when the guns were fired, and left their riders sprawling on the ground. Others stumbled into badger holes and rolled over. The Indians did their work well. They were used to it, and did not bend their bows until their horses almost brushed the reeking sides of the huge brutes. Then they drew to the arrowheads, and leaning forward, buried the shafts up to the feathers. The arrow was said to be even more deadly than the bullet. Already the plain was strewn with dead or dying buffaloes, and the ground seemed to tremble with the thunder of the tread of the affrighted animals. Jasper had dropped three, and Arrowhead had slain two, yet the pace did not slacken. Still the work of death went on. Having seen Pemberton shoot another animal, Haywood became fired with a desire to try his own hand, so he edged away from his companion. Seeing a very large, monstrous-looking buffalo flying away by itself at no great distance, he turned his horse towards it, grasped his gun, shook the reins, and gave chase. Now poor Haywood did not know that the animal he had made up his mind to kill was a tough old bull. Neither did he know that a bull is bad to eat and dangerous to follow, and worse than all, he did not know that when a bull holds his tail stiff and straight up in the air it is a sign that he is in a tremendous rage, and that the wisest thing a man can do is to let him alone. Haywood, in fact, knew nothing, so he rushed blindly on his fate. At first the bull did not raise his tail, but as the rider drew near he turned his enormous shaggy head a little to one side and looked at him out of the corner of his wicked little eye. When Haywood came within a few yards, and, in attempting to take aim, fired off his gun by accident straight into the face of the sun, the tail went up and the bull began to growl. The ferocious aspect of the creature alarmed the artist, but he had made up his mind to kill it, so he attempted to reload as Pemberton had done. He succeeded, and, as he was about to turn his attention again to the bull, he observed one of the men belonging to the fort making towards him. This man saw and knew the artist's danger, and meant to warn him, but his horse unfortunately put one of its feet into a hole and sent him flying head over heels through the air. Haywood was now so close to the bull that he had to prepare for another shot. The horse he rode was a thoroughly good buffalo runner. He knew the dangerous character of the bull, if its rider did not, and kept its eye watchfully upon it. At last the bull lost patience, and suddenly wheeling around, dashed at the horse, but the trained animal sprang nimbly to one side and got out of the way. Haywood was all but thrown. He clutched the mane, however, and held on. The bull then continued its flight. Determined not to be caught in this way again, the artist seized the reins and ran the horse close alongside of the buffalo, whose tail was now as stiff as a poker. Once more the bull turned suddenly around. Haywood pulled the reins violently thus confusing his steed, which ran straight against the buffalo's big hairy forehead. 
it was stopped as violently as if it had run against the side of a house. But poor Haywood was not stopped. He left the saddle like a rocket, flew right over the bull's back, came down on his face, plowed up the land with his nose, and learned a lesson from experience. Fortunately, the spot on which he fell happened to be one of those soft, muddy places in which the buffaloes are fond of rolling their huge bodies in the heat of summer, so that, with the exception of a bruised and dirty face and badly soiled clothes, the bold artist was none the worse for his adventure. End of chapter 10